You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. Disillusionment with Bitcoin, digital privacy and security, South Korea is suffering a massive presidential scandal, and the United Arab Emirates may officially recognize Bitcoin. All this and more on episode 195 here on Wednesday, February 22nd, 2017. Darren? In the traditional markets, JJ, we have gold up to $1,238, silver's up to just a under eighteen dollars, uh, oil is up to fifty three dollars and eighty four cents. The Dow Jones is also up to twenty thousand seven hundred seventy five points. The U.S. Treasury uh, thirty year year is yielding three point zero three three percent. That's up slightly, and the euro by a dollar. The euro buys a dollar oh six. Uh, the uh, yuan buys fifteen cents, and the British pound buys a buck twenty five. Excellent. Uh, Randy, what's going on in the crypto markets? Uh, Well, Bitcoin continues up to $1,129. Litecoin is down to $3.78. Zcash down again to $27.79. Dash continues to climb, however. It's up to $22.09. Ethereum's down to $12.66, just a little bit. Monero is down to $12.80. Augur's rep tokens are down to $4.70, though they've been up in the uh, $5 range earlier in the week. And, Darren, you'll be glad to know that one doge is still equal to (laughs) one doge. Wow. Just a reminder that you can tune into Neocash Radio Every Wednesday night, don't want to miss a single awesome moment of Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, LBRY, and more. Well, we also have a special guest in studio, which I didn't talk about during the tease, but we have Andy here joining us from a Bitcoin ATM company. Hey, welcome to the show, Andy. You're such a tease, JJ. Well, I try. <laughs> <laughs> Got to keep them hooked, right? Well, Andy, you've you've come here for a few different things to talk about, and the the first one and something maybe echoing some of the previous podcasts here on Neo Cash Radio yep. is the disillusionment with bitcoins. Right, and, and I of course have to clarify that's not cryptocurrency itself uh, right. that I'm I'm becoming disillusioned with, but uh, Bitcoin, uh, the protocol. And uh, I, I find it really sad, uh, the, the, the direction and climate that Bitcoin is in currently right now, wherein, uh, honestly, all the reasons, pretty much all the reasons why I got into it in, in the first place back in 2013 have now um, fallen by the wayside and can't be ascribed to Bitcoin any longer. Now, you've, you've worked in the Bitcoin industry, if you will. Like, actually, there's not many people who've actually worked in a Bitcoin job. Because initially there weren't that many, right? Right, right. And then as they grew, many of them didn't quite come to fruition. And those that are successful, you know, are, they're, are doing well, and I'm sure hiring people. But there aren't that many people actually working for a Bitcoin job. And and you've, uh, you know, sort of been a Bitcoin uh, evangelist. Uh, if I'm mispronouncing evangelist. that word, evangelist. That's right. That too. And, and uh, you know, celebrated the the arrival of this cryptocurrency as as we all did. Here on yep. Cash. Yeah, it's been absolutely wonderful not only being able to advocate um, something um, so well that, that I believe in because, um, you know, it's gotten so much traction here in New Hampshire. And, and part of the reason I moved was uh, because of the Free State Project and because I, I, I knew that uh, here we can affect change um, much more so than anywhere else. And, and so part of that has been Bitcoin. Part of that has been liberating people from uh, the 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 grips of the Federal Reserve and also uh, ideally from the surveillance state, right? Um, and so I've been promoting Bitcoin myself. Uh, it's it's been wonderful being able to apply that passion to my daily work uh, in the Bitcoin industry. Uh, but uh, you know, I I have to um, I can't let myself um, be be overcome with you know the echo chamber of uh, Bitcoin is going to revolutionize the world. You know, Bitcoin is the be all end all, uh, and uh, and yet they're having a problem just solving this this issue that's been plaguing them for about a year and a half now. Uh, the block size debate, or whatever you and, want to call and it, and they've known about it for three years, right? Mm-hmm. And and so I mean, is this is this the core of why you are you become disillusioned? Is, is core? core oh, Bitcoin, I, see, I see what you did. There, Bitcoin JJ. core, the core reason. Uh, you or know, a contributing I, reason. I, I I think that's why um, uh, you know part of uh, some of the advantages of Bitcoin. Uh, it, like if you recall back to when you all started talking to people who had no clue of what Bitcoin was for the first time, and and you said, "Hey, there's this uh, you know really awesome way where you can be your own bank. You can you know control 
you can you know be in charge of, of your money you can secure it uh, it's fast it's cheap it's easy it's it's cheaper than credit cards uh, you know it, it's it's private uh, which which you know we've come to find out really it's not um, you know all these uh, talking points are no longer the case and that is in in great part due to the inaction of uh, you know the the core developers of, of Bitcoin and a community that has become very toxic in in this debate, and so uh, you know as activists, I hope we find energy and we we recharge ourselves and and we take stock of what we've accomplished so far. Um, you know, I, I I don't want to get burned out, right? But you know, you you do have to look objectively at where is Bitcoin going? Can it get out of this? And uh, I'm not finding a lot of advantages to Bitcoin itself. And, and I, I right. can give some sure. awesome examples. So, so you know, and, and I, I'm, you know, having these thoughts and just sort of playing devil's advocate for the sake of the conversation, uh, you'll have people say, well, it's, it's, it's been over $1,000 for what, the longest it's ever been over 1000 Is that, or is it 1100 I don't remember which number. It's over 1000 uh, Well, it's over 1000 right? But yeah, the, the, over the, 1100 right now. Yeah, the fact that it's been over this, this amount for this long, there have been peaks where Bitcoin has swung over 1000 and then dropped back down, and some news has, has caused it mm -hmm. to... To tumble, um, you know, that's a nice stashes. Uh, but, uh, you know, what is the unseen here? I mean, right. could, it, could it be 5,000? Could it be 10,000? There, sure. there, there's a, a lot that we're not seeing. And, and so I don't think that you can measure uh, performance. Well, just, that. just before the show, we talked about uh, the, the transaction fees. Once again, it came up, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and as we talked about last week with Eric Voorhees' essay, there was a point at which the decision of what, how much fee to assess to it, right? It, it was mm -hmm. basically the decision was how, how what's what's we're economical, normal. Should we do premium? Like, just that little bit of time. Once again, it was his his it, part of his estimation of the true cost of that transaction fee was wasted time and wasted energy and stressing out whether or not it's going to make this block in time for for whatever reason, right? That that was a fantastic article, and uh, you know Eric went into. Uh, a, a lot of what is unseen, unfortunately, by by the proponents of of small blocks. And and just before uh, we started here, uh, I was I was conducting a Bitcoin transaction, and uh, the recommended fee was a dollar thirteen cents. That's huge. That's insane. And, and then you you pot it down to to you know the the sub economic level, uh, the lowest possible one is it was still fifty six cents. Right, fifty six uh, for the minimum suggested miners fee. For this transaction, yeah. that's that's like huge. I mean, when we first this show is going on nearly four years now, Darren. Yep. Next in two months, it'll be four years. Yep. And back when we were first starting, it it was sub, it was cents. You know, it was like two or three cents was like the highest I'd ever seen. Like that was amazing that it even got that high. And and then now we're talking about regular regular transactions being over a dollar. I mean, that is a huge huge jump, just order of magnitudes greater, right? So mm -hmm. before let's well, let's get we have some a lot of things to talk about a lot of content but you mentioned one thing uh, when you were first uh, introducing yourself and that's the Free State Project and Darren uh, we've got some news to talk about here that you really wanted to get yeah. to so the the listeners may not know but the Free State Project is a uh, a, a nonprofit organization that uh, main purpose is to move twenty thousand or or to encourage twenty thousand liberty loving people to move to New Hampshire and once they're uh, uh, do their best at bringing forth a society where the maximum role of government is protection of life, liberty, and property. So, uh, and this this project has been interesting to just watch and and see, and see unfurl. And one reason I wanted to bring it up today, JJ, is uh, today the governor signed a constitutional carry bill into law. So, uh, in New Hampshire, <clears throat> there is no permit needed to carry a pistol, whether it be open carry or uh, concealed carry. Right. So uh, and so that uh, that's kind of the proof of concept that uh, that we have here. And of course, um, there, there's a lot of different people that have worked on this, and it's not just one uh, nonprofit uh, doing or, or one nonprofit didn't encourage this to happen. It was it was a, a, a conglomeration of people, right? But um, 
So there, it, essentially, there's there's more freedom in your own personal security here in New Hampshire uh, thanks to this recent uh, bill. Right, right. Like, uh, yeah, it's it's funny since moving here, I saw that there was this guy that was pulled out of his car and beat up and whatever, and I was like, how do those people not get shot? The guys that are beating them up, right? Because right. it was on a New Hampshire website, and I'm like, oh, this was in Chicago. <laughs> and, oh, and, right, right. <clears throat> but in New Hampshire, you don't, you're like, why? You know, why don't they stop? You know, they they. There's a, a even if the person that was pulled out of the car was uh, was not uh, prepared to defend himself, there might be somebody walking by that would uh, take pity on him. Sure, I mean, just uh, recently at a store, and we got a bunch of things to talk about. I was uh, exiting the store, and there was a, a mom, a young mom, seemed a, maybe a middle aged mom, and she was open carrying a really nice. nice uh, I believe I believe it's a Glock, mm -hmm. and uh, you know she was helping one kid into the cart, and the other kid was just right next to her, but like. There's that, you know, that sort of uh, the porcupine and, you know, don't don't mess with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I prefer to conceal carry from a tactical uh, standpoint, but she was wearing clothing that was too tight to really conceal carry. <laughs> yeah. So when I when I moved here, my proof of concept was uh, stopping a uh, seatbelt law in New Hampshire. And so now if, if people are out there and they need a proof of concept, well, passing the concealed carry, that's a much bigger sure. uh, bar that we have. Well, we're going to move on to some stories here and a lot more to talk about. Uh, and then this one, Andy, was one that you were interested in. And it's the, it concerns Danish police using Bitcoin blockchain to arrest darknet buyers. So a specialized program is being used by Danish law enforcement to track Bitcoin transactions from seller to buyer. Su suspects who received the drugs through the mail may have their Bitcoin transaction history examined against drug sales records collected by police departments. So this is a way where the, the blockchain is transparent, mm -hmm. and if there's a way to connect your person to an address, then we can, you, know, you, you can trace back the, the other address, for example. Uh, yeah, it's, it's something that getting into Bitcoin, you know, we, we know it's pseudonymous, you know, so long as you don't uh, reveal or connect your address uh, to who you actually are, then you can operate with some degree of anonymity, but it's not truly private. Uh, but for the longest time, people did think that Bitcoin is, you know, the dark money, the the uh, the, the money for criminals. In fact, this, this uh, article uh, kind of echoes it, uh, that, uh, saying, you know, that's why many crim criminals around the world probably celebrated when the cryptocurrency Bitcoin was launched back in 2009. With, quote, you know, with untraceable internet currency, crooks could finally enjoy the anonymity of cash without risking being caught red-handed out in the physical world. And um, maybe in the early days, because there weren't trace analysis tools, blockchain analysis tools out there, uh, you could get by. But increasingly, if you're using Bitcoin, uh, if you're getting paid for your work in Bitcoin, if you're conducting most of your daily transactions, which... Here in New Hampshire, and, and also just given the options online these days, you can uh, live totally off of Bitcoin. And there are even um, uh, landlords here right. that accept Bitcoin for rent. So let's say let's say you are getting paid in Bitcoin, you're giving your landlord Bitcoin um, uh, for rent, you're making your daily purchases. Now with the tools that the FBI and MIT Labs and you know other researchers out there have, uh, there's... Uh, there's little doubt that all of your transactions can be uh, monitored in a way that has never been before been possible with just cash. Sure. So cash is is still by far the the, the most private, save for um, what I think are some promising cryptocurrencies out there like uh, like Monero. Right. Yeah. And in fact, we speaking to that point, we have a story here from Washington State: the bill to ban Bitcoin from marijuana sales fails. It uh, never left committee, uh, but the, the from the Bitcoin.com article, uh, a quote here is, quote, cash is dangerous, suggested Pose a Bit founder Ryan Hammond. It's dangerous to hold, dangerous to move, and you become a target for potential crimes. From one standpoint, having cash makes you a target for, for mugging and stealing, and especially a marijuana business that might have a lot of cash on hand. That's true. It's Armored just cars a, coming at certain times. Right, it's just it's a piggy bank. Scope right. out, yeah. And then the uh, also from the article, uh, Pose a Bit, I, be, I believe that's the uh, the town post a bit Ch mm -hmm. uh, chief compliance officer. I'm not certain if that's the town or the whatever, but anyway, he echoed the concern. If law enforcement has questions about a certain transaction, if they get paid in cash, there's no way to answer this question because it's no way to link the cash from person to person. But you, but you can link the Bitcoin. That's right. 
And, and even still, if you do uh, pay someone in, in Bitcoin and they look back at, at your prior transactions, they could they could assume your your wallet balance. So yeah. there's still that that issue with you know um, you you've obviously got more Bitcoin here. Um, you know here here's a five dollar wrench. Uh, let me get at it. So with with this in mind, do you uh, do you like uh, Monero or Zcash? Either of those currencies. I, for for sort of solving the problem of well Bitcoin isn't it's pseudo anonymous as we've said but do like either of those sort of uh, seem like they offer more value than the Bitcoin blockchain at this point? I, I'm I'm gracious for the developments of both and those who have uh, you know really pushed forward um, both Monero and Zcash. I, I prefer Monero myself, um, but uh, you know and I'm holding some and looking to see where it goes. Hopefully the ecosystem develops because. I think that that really captures the cypherpunk vision of P2P electronic cash that Satoshi Nakamoto uh, created and really drives home the privacy point, which is just completely lacking, you know. Yeah, that's... Well, I want to talk... I want to find out a little bit about what what we're talking about with blockchain analysis here. I, my understanding, at least, is um, if you're using this as a casual buyer and you've you've procured your Bitcoin maybe with just through a cash transaction through someone you know or something mm-hmm. like that, um, the likelihood of things being able to be traced to you are not likely. But what they're, what they're able to analyze is just they're looking for recurring patterns and being able to perhaps uh, draw some conclusions um, you know that, that hopefully they'll be able to prove beyond reasonable doubt that this was you. But um, you know, I, I don't think if you're just using this as a casual tool and you're looking for um, privacy and you're not trying to move a whole bunch of money or anything like that. Uh, regardless, I, I, I value privacy certainly, and I think people should be able to do what they want with their own money. Um, but I just wanted to know if if I think beyond that, you know, if you're using uh, like apps, wallets on your phones where you're entering your personal information, uh, certainly there's 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 much simpler ways for them to be able to find out who you are and how much you've got and what, how many wallets and things like that. So, um, I just wanted to talk a little about that, but also we've discussed here in the past. I mean, um, what we started talking about the block size debate, we've had Roger Veer on the show before with a special interview. Um, we've talked about it at length. Uh, we've also talked about Zcash Monero and the ability for these, uh, zero knowledge proofs that Zcash, um, uses. They're looking at ways for using them over Ethereum, um, mm-hmm. Any thoughts on Ethereum? Anything you like or don't dislike about it? I, I think that's fantastic. I mean, Ethereum itself, if if used as a, a daily currency in lieu of Bitcoin, it's fast and it's cheap. It's it's got those two properties that that you know attracted so many to uh, to Bitcoin, uh, and the the coupling that with the zk snarks uh, from from Zcash, uh, if if that gets implemented in a really user friendly way. Um, then you know it's the second largest coin in, in market cap, while also enabling some really cool projects uh, based on this you know Ethereum computer. Uh, it's it's got some great potential, and I'm I'm very glad to see the competition hopefully putting pressure on Bitcoin uh, as as it sees fewer and fewer uh, users because of its drawbacks these days. Well, and for people who do. Who know Bitcoin? Bitcoin's sort of enjoying the like genericized trademark, you know, the, the, like Kleenex. No one says f- facial <laughs> tissue; they say Kleenex. They don't say copy machine; you say Xerox. So Bitcoin, for a lot of people, is the sort of de facto cryptocurrency. Mm-hmm. Um, they may not even know the word cryptocurrency, but they've heard of Bitcoin. So, for people who are still uh, transacting in Bitcoin because they haven't seen an altcoin that maybe satisfies them, or maybe the people they do business with, um, what are some steps that you might? recommend to those folks who wanted to retain more of their privacy in these transactions other tools out there that you might have some information about well it's it's going to be hard with bitcoin there are some uh tumblers out there but we've seen uh some of the news stories uh from from uh, the european union trying to make uh bitcoin tumbling illegal uh so uh you you can use them out there but it's very difficult and then uh then you do have to worry uh how uh, you know, so let's say you've washed or tumbled uh, some coins into a new wallet, uh, and you don't spend the full balance of that wallet. Well, what do you have to do? You have to then um, take the the balance back. You have to rewash those coins, and then maybe those are tainted. So you can't put that back in your main wallet. Uh, it's just it's it's not easy um, for for me even with uh, with Bitcoin. So one of the cool things I've seen proposed is 
because Monero has such um, really great privacy characteristics, what you can do is you can use a tool like Shapeshift, uh, which is a, a easy way to, like, say, convert crypt cryptocurrency to cryptocurrency. You just pick a pair and it, it transmits it as soon as pretty much as soon as you send it. You can send your Bitcoin, convert it to Monero. Uh, don't use that same service uh, to to convert Monero back to Bitcoin. Uh, use maybe something like XMR.2, XMR.to, uh, and that converts uh, Monero back to Bitcoin. So if you just dip your Bitcoin into Monero, the privacy enhancing <laughs> characteristics of Monero are, are preserved and you, you've got a way to wash your Bitcoin without trusting necessarily a, a, some tumbler that could just make off with your bitcoins but there's more than just the <clears throat> the blockchain you're using isn't there more like uh, privacy through communications using certain encrypted methods of communication signal and, and various whatsapp uh, type applications yeah i'm glad you touched on that because it's it's something i i recently enabled with uh, mycelium uh, there's a way to uh, so for anyone familiar with tor it's a anonymizing network primarily used for browsing, but you can also route applications through it. Uh, you can, on your Android phone, uh, download Orbot from the Google Play Store, and that's that's Tor on your phone. And if you tell Mycelium to use Tor, then what you're doing is you're broadcasting your transactions, you're receiving your price quotes, everything through an anonymizing network. And if you think of that, because because few people will consider well, you know, the, this this wallet isn't traced to me, and these Bitcoins aren't traced. Well, yeah, but your IP address is. And if someone is looking really hard, um, and they don't have to be doing that now, it could just be the NSA cataloging all this for some future date to look back on and trace you to, <laughs> uh, then, you know, they're, they're getting your IP address. They may be associating that with your transactions, and therefore your wallet, and therefore your circle of friends. And, um, uh, you know, Randy, you were saying that... Uh, you know, before, you know, for the casual user, it's it's not really something that they they have to worry about being linked to. Um, but then you have to start thinking about degrees of connection, degrees of separation okay. between your associates. So if if I go to a Bitcoin meetup and I buy uh, $50 worth of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin from someone there, then maybe our IP addresses are linked, our locations are linked, we know who we associate with, at what time... Uh, of, of the day, of the week, uh, where those Bitcoins have touched, uh, even if they're drawing conclusions, even if they're erroneous conclusions, they could be very dangerous erroneous conclusions. And so then I have to prove, you know, no, I'm not associated with these, these tainted coins. So going forward, uh, of course, with all the NSA surveillance and stuff, they may be able to predict where I'm going to be uh, Thursday afternoon at five o'clock, two weeks from now, better than I could myself. Uh, well, I mean, if you're if you're really concerned about the NSA, I think just having timestamp timestamp packets, uh, knowing exactly what packets are going to your device at what time, mm -hmm. and then linking them up where they came from, I think they would know everything you do, forever. I Perhaps, mean, if you're yeah. really if you're really that if you want to go down that rabbit hole, they've already got all the information they need. They can just put it together and post. You know what I'm saying? So. But there are great tools out there that do a lot to offer you privacy, and, and if that's something you value, then you can certainly find out more about that um, uh, and through, like, what are some of them? Just name a few of them that you use. Signal is fantastic. I think it's the gold standard. Edward Snowden highly recommends it. Um, replaces your, your existing SMS messenger on your phone, so seamlessly you talk via regular SMS to people that don't have it yet, and as soon as they get Signal, you're speaking, you're talking to them encrypted. I think the the best out there, but and you can also uh, set to disappearing messages, and uh, so it, there's no record of your messages that are ever kept on your phone, the other person's phone, or the uh, the connecting server. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, uh, just looking quick at the node counter, we we mentioned the blockchain thing, and right now node counter is listing out of the last thousand blocks. The Bitcoin unlimited blocks are about twenty point one percent, and the Segwit is twenty five point nine. So it does not seem likely that Segwit will ever reach the 95% needed to turn on and activate those portions of the code. Um, so I we're going we're to have to find some other solution because it seems dead on arrival at and, this point. And yeah, and that's one thing we've been talking a lot about here in, in Neocache Radio is the variety of different, uh, basically, protocols that have come out that offer different values using a blockchain solution. Obviously not Bitcoin, often referred to as altcoins. 
so we talk about Ethereum a lot. We talk about uh, we mentioned Ma- uh, Monero and 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 Zcash, but Dash is another one that's been skyrocketing lately and gotten really popular. They do things a lot different than a lot of other coins, but I think that's what we're seeing is the competing. The market is competing with itself and offering a better solution using these new tools. And Bitcoin is kind of, it's got one trick and it's not doing that trick very well. Mm-hmm. That's, it's got prime mover advantage. Yeah. Yes. And as far as the other advantages, it's quickly whittling away. I think adoption is still, adoption and name recognition is still very huge and right. shouldn't be discounted. But because um, there are a lot of people who, uh, for the same reasons they don't like upgrading their crappy credit card terminal machines every you know couple years or whatever uh, they don't necessarily want to be on the have to keep being on the cutting edge of what the you know the, keeping an eye checking the prices every morning for the different uh, I don't think that's on every business owner's mind like oh I'd like another thing to do in the morning <laughs> certainly if it's returning some some yield for them then that that'd be great but uh you know, just again, if certainly for businesses who have gone to the steps of taking Bitcoin now that there are more uh, coins being accepted through the same apps, like anyone who uses Coinbase can get Ethereum or Bitcoin. I don't know if they've added any others yet, but uh, yeah, that that adoption I think is is huge. So, well, speaking of adoption, the uh, story here: the United Arab Emirates may officially recognize Bitcoin. Uh, last week, we talked about Dubai and the pro blockchain stance the Crown Prince has stated. This week, we have news about the Central Bank of UAE and a document they recently published titled Regulatory Framework for Stored Values and Electronic Payment Systems. A section basically outlaws virtual currencies, which caused a stir. And when pressed about this, Bitcoin and other digital currencies, uh, Central Bank Governor Mubarak Rashid Kamis al-Mansouri confirmed that the document doesn't apply to Bitcoin and digital currencies, adding that the Central Bank is carefully considering legalizing Bitcoin. So another... Government is recognizing uh, the value, I suppose to say, or or maybe the the need to to keep up with the times. I, it depends what's meant by uh, recognizing, because sure. that could be a, a terrible thing. Um, I, I think it was in in uh, Russia where you know the the central bank finally issued uh, some some recognition of Bitcoin in a very negative direction. So uh, I'm I'm. Glad that they're considering legalizing it, but uh, the surprise that it wasn't de facto legal. Yeah, well, that's the thing is that the paper doesn't actually apply to Bitcoin. So, you know what I'm saying? It's like they haven't exactly said it's illegal either. That's that's what I think is is the point being made is that they're actually going to make a decision on it. And if they're following the footsteps of Dubai they're going to do it in a, in a more positive manner of we're actually going to make use of this or we're going to adopt the par- portions of technology. And Dubai, is the crown prince, has said that he wants the, the government run on blockchains by 2020. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. So the transparency in government and you know eliminating corruption would really go a long way with blockchains and, and that sort of technology. From what so. I've heard, the UAE um, leads the world in, in terms of uh, lack of, of corruption in, in their politics. Not to say their politics are great. I'm I'm not uh, too cognizant of of their internal ones, but when it comes to uh, saying that they're legalizing Bitcoin, I kind of think of that in terms of well, uh, oh, they uh, X and Y state wants to legalize cannabis. Uh, well, you don't have to legalize cannabis to say well you can you know treat it like tomatoes. What they mean by legalizing cannabis or Bitcoin in this case is that there's going to be taxes. Sure. There's going to be regulation. Regulation, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Randy, uh, you've got a story about corruption that we definitely need to get to before the end of the show. It's yeah. pretty big here. Well, and this has been going on for uh, a little while. It was, I guess, dwarfed in my news feed by all the junk surrounding uh, the unfortunate 2016 election here in the United States. Uh, but over in South Korea, their first female president... Uh, Park Junhui, sorry, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, she's apparently been under a spell for her tenure there. She has a very, very close friend, Choi Soon Sil, who's a private citizen with no security clearance, but she was allowed to edit some of President Park's most important speeches. Uh, she apparently runs two nonprofit organizations uh, that she used to allegedly solicit. 
about $70 million worth of donations from different corporations around South Korea to curry favor with the president. Uh, the reason we bring it up now is because the acting chair of Samsung uh, has been arrested uh, with alleged ties to this um apparently about 37 million dollars of donations were sent to this close friend uh of the president's uh it was to go towards her daughter's horse riding uh and things like that it's really weird so the president's friend who's been doing all this behind the scenes stuff uh getting all all kinds of uh Docu information yeah information documents, documents anything she was demanding from the president what happened was uh the president's parents were assassinated and um th this close friend her father was the leader of this uh what what people are calling a cult um called the ministry of life or something like that i can't find the, the name of it right now but um was apparently the father of this president was assassinated long ago because he was unable to shake the uh the rasputin like uh, control of this person of of this now president's friend's father so this is like repeating but that's why the, her father was assassinated before so allegedly this is all happening again the south korean president is under the spell of this uh rasputin like character who gets her to do anything she wants and is apparently getting money from businesses across the country uh to get to get her way well, and so this has all come to light now, and the a bunch of investigations, and as you said, arrests have been happening. Uh, both the president's uh, is the president still president yet? Uh, she there was an overwhelming vote to impeach her in December, but there's of course an ongoing internal invest investigation. Uh, you know, they'll probably clear her of any actual wrongdoing. Well, who knows? It'll be some kind of verbal a little hand slap or something, but uh, the power has been yielded uh, apparently while while the investigation's ongoing. So the power has been shifted to the prime minister and an, and an acting president. Just a huge scandal. And, and really, I, I'm waiting for the movie to come out because all of this sounds so far-fetched. It's it's like, has, it's have like, you kept up with this No, at all? no. <clears throat> yeah, it sounds like one of the greatest soap operas. It does. Well, and I want to I wanted to bring it up especially because I certainly we've been we've been bashing Clinton and Trump I think equally and this was a huge argument for so many people who were against Trump and pro Hillary. I'm I'm for neither of them, but it was just that, you know, something like this could never happen with a female president and it it's the power that corrupts. It's the it's setting setting up a central structure, a central point of failure uh, with rulers and people. Right, that are it has ruled. nothing to do with yeah. the individual. It's not about the individual at all. The system. And clearly, I mean this this president, for all we know, could be so delusional that she may think she's doing great things. But here, it sounds like she doesn't even know she was just doing what she was told by a, what she thought was a close confidant and friend. But this person was accepting, you know, he, allegedly accepting huge bribes, and so it. It's it's that power structure that you that I would warn people to be leery of. So I'd be interested to know the details and and theology of this cult. I mean, it's, it sounds like a successful Scientology, a politically successful Scientology. Yeah, I'm I'm looking for it in the articles. I will of course have the links up to it uh, on neocashradio.com, but uh, I'm I'm not finding it immediately. Uh, there was one called Movement for a New Mind that was. Um, he, oh, that's right. The, okay, so the father, the guy who like is the father of the now friend who's currying all the favor, he he started this weird organization that, and then started another one called Movement for a New Mind. But um, the current president is 40 years his junior, and he was like a really close mentor to her. And I guess a lot of people thought it was, it was very, very strange. Um, they've denied that they had any kind of, you know, uh, close sexual relationship or anything like that but but who knows it's it sounds like a definitely I'm, I'm some serious. kind of brainwashing there's gonna, be, there's gonna be a movie about this and it's gonna be <laughs> mind-blowing and you're probably not gonna believe it and the movie probably won't go far enough to tell the actual truth i mean that's that's the reality <laughs> this is like you can't art can't even can't even keep up with this crazy stuff church wow. of eternal life wow church of eternal life there's a lot of Asian new religious movements, uh, and, and there's a Wikipedia article on all of them, and, and I went through them one day, and I'm like, I, I want to pick a new cult to join, because, you know, I, I, I just have this okay. fascination there's with, the Moonies. with strange belief systems. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I found one that actually, that struck me very well. Um, it seemed like uh, it promoted rationality and, and, and uh, science and things like that, but it was just glossed over with this, like, 
religious cultish context mm. you know to make money right I, well i mean it's been a money maker for how long you know, in oh, history religion? of humanity, <laughs> right? Says, that's what Ron Hubbard says, yeah. right? Is that his name? Well, uh, all of this corruption aside, I, I did want to get back to one more question with uh, with Andy before we let him go. Um, you, you have been talking more a little bit about Monero and that, um, you know, not so much on Zcash. I'm just wondering, wh- I haven't looked much into the privacy features and the anon- anonymity features of uh, Monero certainly not Monero versus Zcash. We've talked a little more about Zcash, but if you if you have just a, a sum up maybe of what differentiates the two for you, sure. So uh, Monero has uh, what's called Ring CT um, uh, transactions, um, and uh, those obfuscate the the source and destination of these transactions. So it's in ways a, a black box. There there's no way, and you can even increase the uh, the the ring size, basically how many uh, plausibly deniable transactions are commingled with yours uh, to give you even greater privacy. And uh, supposedly this this approach has been uh, vetted and has been out there for a little while. And they they they're uh, uh, you know very active in development. I think Zcash. Uh, well, so it's sort of mixing your transaction with others in a way, like sort of just putting in, in inputs and outputs that, but not showing. Right, okay. and there are a couple other things that it does too. They're in fact integrating um, uh, I2P, which is kind of like Tor, uh, into their their wallet as well. As far as Zcash goes, um, I'm you know it seems to be great technology, except for the fact that it's brand new and that there's a lot of uh, overhead to actually creating a a private transaction within Zcash. Whereas with Monero, it's on by default. Every single transaction that you're going to make is is has the same default level of, of privacy. So uh, I like that. I like with Signal, with with other tech, uh, privacy-focused tech, that it forces you to always be private. There's no ambiguity there. Sure. Gotcha. Wow. I'm glad I asked. Thank you. Well, hey, thanks for coming on the show, Andy. And, uh, you know, it's a pleasure having you on talking about these sorts of things. And Darren, of course, disillusionment, we mentioned how... Yeah, I was just looking it up the, according to uh, tradeblock.com. The uh, the pool, the pool of transactions is over uh, is just around sixty megabytes right now. Wow! And there's cool. over a, a million unconfirmed bitcoins. What? Well, that is a, that's a huge amount. That's absolutely a huge that's amount. Insane. I I still have a a one dollar transaction from two days ago that hasn't confirmed. Wow. Yeah. Well, this is uh, JJ. Darren and Randy for Neocash Radio. You can check out our website, neocashradio.com, to see the show notes from today's episode as well as uh, all, our other ep- all our other episodes. So, uh, thank you so much for joining us here, Neocash Radio. We discuss the future of money today. Mm-hmm.